Well, hello everybody. The lights are a little. Our uh, the local time is 1:41 p.m. And we will begin our program on Seletsia at the top of the hour. That's 19 minutes from now, but I have a lot of thank yous. A lot of thank yous to uh, march through here uh, in the next 19 minutes. So if you're here only for geology content, please skip ahead 19 minutes. And that will be the beginning of our Seletsia program. But if you're watching live and you want to join in the little community here, there's uh, some show and tell. So today we're not only focusing on an exotic terrain called Seletsia, we're also throwing in as a bonus feature another exotic terrain called the Chugash up in Alaska. And then you are invited to come back for the last of our shows in this series, Sunday morning, 9 a.m., putting it all together. So you know I'm persnickety. I already don't like the fact I'm so, I noticed this a little bit last time, I'm so bleached out. Uh, let me just play with that for a second. I do have a couple of lights set up. Uh, I'll, I'll play with it. Thanks for joining us. Are we functional? Don is in Los Angeles, and David's in San Diego, near the PRB. John and Kathy, Jim, geologically speaking, hello, Todd. Uh, Dino's in Minnesota. Um, are we doing okay? Are we five by five? Sabre, thank you for that report. Bill's in Portland, and Michael says yes. That's good. Thank you, Michael. Bernadette, hello. Lori's in Southern Oregon. Lars is from Aloha, Oregon. San Diego. Hello, Oscar. The lights are working great, although I don't get this. I guess the camera takes, yeah, right there. The camera takes a while to adjust to that. Don't really know how to deal with that. That's probably just me noticing something like that. Hello, Sharon. Um, so I'm going to do some thank yous right away. I'm going to see a few more five by fives. It's the dark walls in the background. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, no more screwing around. We gotta get we gotta get rolling. Uh, let me check my laptop and then we'll get to some thank yous. So we're doing okay. You can sound. Uh, I'm sounding just fine. Uh, I'm just gonna hesitate one last time, and then we will we will get rolling. Okay, all the stuff's over here on the kitchen table. I got, I got papers everywhere. I got no room, and Bijou's sleeping right here on the sofa, so I'm going to have to go back and forth a little bit. Thank you, Ray, from Half Moon Bay who has experience with filming outdoors. And he sent a bunch of surplus fuzzies for microphones. So assuming that I'm back outdoors next summer or spring, and it's particularly windy here. So uh, I've enclosed a number of these funnies in case you run into a lot of wind doing your outdoor at home sessions. Uh, I brought a lot of these to the Arctic last year, figuring it was going to be really cold and windy. Okay, so thank you very much. And a box from Elaine in New Mexico. 
Um, nice things. Please accept this gift. One for you and one for Liz is a small token of my appreciation. I refer to the beanie or toque, if you will, as my exotic terrain creation. It is a true melange of various yarns. I just cannot say if it's poorly sorted or not. So Elaine knitted winter caps for Liz and I, and included some rocks from New Mexico as well. And it is an exotic terrain hat with many different, a little Cache Creek in here, there's a little Quinellia. Thank you, Elaine, for your generous gift from New Mexico. This was hand delivered last week. I'm sorry I missed you, Sean. Sean is from Seattle. He's a proud Zet nerd. And uh, in the spirit of giving thanks, I present you and Liz with my gifts of gratitude. You've given so much of your time and talent. Uh, I, this is homemade wine. My gift is also one of time and passion, homemade or garage wine I have made myself. Does that say melange? <laughs> oh no, Meritage and C18. There's more here about you get your grapes from Red Mountain just west of Rich uh, Richland, considered one of the best grape growing regions in Washington. And uh, I'm sure that I don't have the taste to really understand the delicacy that you've gifted us, but Liz does, Sean. So I will enjoy, but Liz will really enjoy because she, uh, was not raised uh, in Wisconsin. So thank you very much. <clears throat> Terry and John from Carlisle, Pennsylvania, they saw the show last week. I don't wanna jinx it, but They said next time you, if you ever have another time where you have major buffering streaming problems. Here's a his and her. Damn it doll. Let me demonstrate. Damn it. Damn it. Just woke Bijou up from his nap. I'm sorry. I'm sorry Bijou. Damn it, I woke up the cat. Damn it. Thank you, Terry and John from Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Hard to keep up. Embarrassing and uh, touching at the same time. From Sandy in Seattle. I never get tired of looking at rocks and I assume you feel the same. Here are some pretty rocks with a practical side you can share with your family. Soap rocks. Soap rocks, they smell wonderful. Oh my. Thank you, Sandy.
Eleanor in Texas noticed that I uh, ate a part of the fruitcake, so of course I couldn't restore the fruitcake. I ate a part of it. Makes sense. Although my brain problems go far beyond that, Eleanor, but thank you for creating that. And this is from Francis Diem. Uh, Francis, didn't catch where you live, Francis. Maybe you live in Georgia because you sent from the Georgia Fruit Com Fruitcake Company. A fruitcake from some someplace in Georgia, from Claxton, Georgia. Now we have dueling fruit fruitcakes. I think I cut open. A fruitcake from Georgia. Thank you, Francis. The fruitcake is our analogy for all the exotic terrains out here in the West, if, uh, if you're new to us. The Francis knows the joke. Oh, I'm sorry I woke you up, Bijou. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I should have thought ahead. Uh, also from the South, East. Uh, just like my grandma Helen used to send at Christmas time, a box of citrus from Florida. The gift is from Gwendolyn, and it also says, thank you so much for enriching our lives, Wendy and George from Florida. And this is a box from Hale Groves in Vero Beach, Florida. Look at how they present the citrus and some other wonderful treats from the Sunshine State. Are you the, yeah, you're the Sunshine State. We will enjoy uh, for sure. Thank you very much. And one more, this was a heavy box. Uh, you know, each time the delivery guy comes to the house, like there's a bunch of them now, right? There's a FedEx person, a regular mailman, and I just kind of go, hey, I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, I know you gotta ship the vaccine, but obviously this is more important. So uh, what do you got today? So uh, this is from, uh, GiveThemBeer.com. This is from Julia, who resides in Nicklandia. Sounds like a delightful place to me. Uh, perhaps some of my enemies think that looks that sounds like some sort of hellhole that you live in, Julia. But uh, Nicklandia. Thank you for the gifts of your knowledge, time, and humor, all helping us to stay sane in a crazy year. Joy and peace to you, Bijou, your loved ones, and all the Nick cohort, even Muffler Boy. You're a better person than I am, Julia. A beer advent calendar. And I think we'll have to break into the beer advent calendar at the end of today's show. I haven't even... Let's see what we got. Is it the 11th? It's the 11th. I didn't even think about that. Wow. I uh, can't... Per can't even pronounce it. Pernicious India Pale Ale. Thank you, Julia in Nicklandia. I'll keep this out. We'll, we'll do a toast with that.
I think this is going to be your time today, and you need to say, I promise not to wrestle with your papers today. I promise not to get in the way. Um, I promise. I promise to do all those things. Like, this is your nap time usually, but the damn it doll woke you up, and by the damn it doll, I mean me. But I think you can hang out in here if you promise to just watch and learn and take notes. Do you have your notebook? Do you have your Mead Smiler notebook, like Rocky Crandall did? Oh boy. Well, this is kind of like looking at 19-year-olds in a full auditorium back in the day. This is about the look they had. Like I'm on my phone, why, why are you starting class? All right. You're gonna sleep right here, aren't you? Okay, let me get you back in your sleeping area. I hope you're not as sleepy as this guy is. There you go. There you go. You just relax. Okay, my watch says we have uh, two and a half minutes, so let me say hi to a few more people and make sure that we're doing okay. And maybe I don't have that. Yeah, I do. Okay. I'll have to just remember to come in here kind of tight. Uh... Elsie in Devon, UK, and Scotland, hello. Uh, uh, Jerome, nice to see you here. Thank you for your help, as always. Doug, and uh, there's a lot of five-by-fives coming in. Daryl's here, I see. That's wonderful. Those two guys have been particularly helpful um, all fall. Uh, Rotary Power, thank you for the audio and video report. That always makes me happy. Paul in Poland, hello. Garrett the Dutch Night Owl in the Netherlands. Natalie is in, uh, uh, in Montreal and Don's in Fairbanks. David's down in Vegas. Peter's in uh, Dayton, Ohio. Jay is in North Carolina. Uh, Tom says, dip your face in oatmeal. Well, same to you, Tom. Uh, Neil from Northern Ireland. Oh, it's great. Just great. Um... A couple more hellos, and then I think I got to start thinking about what we're doing today. Turn off the front porch light. See, this is, this is my personal hell, you know, where I'm just constantly just kind of trying to react to whatever anybody says, and then uh, I, I don't know what to do. But I, I think since I still have this bleach stuff, I am going to turn off a few things. Yeah. Okay, I got two minutes. Let me concentrate on what we're doing today with Celestia and the Chugash. Chukiesh, and uh, we will begin session Y. Thank you for joining us this afternoon, this evening, this morning. Okay, you're going to stay right there? Is that what you're going to do? Now. Hey Wallace, you're on the Chugash terrain right now? That's sweet. Hello from down south.
Well, here's to you. Thank you for coming today. Thank you for joining us. Uh, it's a gloomy, uh, snowy afternoon here in Ellensburg, Washington, and I hope things are good and fine and tidy where you live, uh, wherever you are all around the world. Uh, today is uh, a session called Silesia, and we do have people from all over the world, and so we need to do some basic things. Uh, I think many geology fans here in Washington, at least, or Western Oregon, maybe Southern British Columbia, know about Silesia, but um, uh, there's plenty to talk about, and we're also going up to the Chugash today. You are welcome to come back if you like for the last of our sessions. This is Exotic Terrains A to Z, and we're to Z on Sunday morning, 9 a.m. We're going to try to put it all together. And you're like, huh? What does that mean? It's like, I have no idea what that means. Uh, I, got, I got some time to figure out what I'm doing, but I don't really know how I'm going to do it. Jerome Lessman in, in um, Nanaimo, British Columbia, gave me the idea to do some kind of putting everything together, but... Uh, uh, once I'm done with you here this afternoon, I'll put some serious thought into that, and I'm hoping that there'll be some, a couple of new things, but mostly just a way to kind of figure out what we know and what we maybe still don't know. There's plenty we don't know about these exotic terrains, and so uh, it'll be kind of uh, framed in that manner. Today, uh, I have some introductory comments. And the main message is I woke up this morning and I thought I had a plan for you with three acts as normal. And I just double checked uh, one email and one uh, GSA talk that was sent to me. And as I was double checking those things, I'm like, whoa, whoa, what, what, whoa, 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 I can't, oh. So I made some connections this morning and uh, fleshed out a few things, and so I'm particularly loose today, not drinking-wise, but just um, I have no idea what Act 3 is going to look like. Uh, but I decided instead of just ignoring all this breaking stuff that was coming in uh, by email, I wanted to use it, even though I'm still literally today uh, trying to process uh, what I think I know and what I think I don't know. I know <laughs> that's a stupid thing to say. So my point is, uh, we'll start nice and tidy in a familiar way. We're going to go to Silesia. We're going to go to Chugash right now. Uh, and then as this session moves along, it'll be more and more freelance, uh, where I've got papers all over the, the couch here, kind of roughly grouped uh, by theme. But um, it could work. It could be a disaster. Let's see. Kind of fun to watch a guy have a total train wreck on live, uh, on a live stream. So let's go ahead. Let's not screw around. We have two new exotic terrains to learn today, and it's been a couple weeks since we've are kind of uh, introduced ourselves to a, a part of the fruitcake. So, out of all these colored pencils, from Patrick, age seven. Here's all the colors we have prescribed, and I ran out of room at the bottom, and so I, I squeezed it in right at the top here. Let it be known, Patrick, from this point forward, Silesia, one of our featured exotic terrains today, will be colored red. Just plain old red. That's what it says on the colored pencil, red. And the Chugash, mostly up in Alaska, but we'll see there's a sliver of it down further south, foliage green. So isn't that cute? I have, I have holiday colors, Christmas colors. Yeah, that's by design. I'm a genius. Okay, great. So let's go to Mappy McMap. We weren't done, actually. We were not done coloring Mappy McMap. What do those two colors for Silesia and Chugash look like on a variety of maps? Well, first of all, on this very complicated map of the North Cascades, we do not have red and green. So we have left the North Cascades for good, although we will revisit the Straight Creek Fault just very ever so briefly today. But we're not going to look here. We've got to go to true Mappy McMap. And there's Mappy McMap. 
But I got a, a cute email that I want to share with you. And the email is from Michael in Trim. And Michael and his three-year-old daughter, Ni, it's a Vietnamese name, they have been making Mappy McMahon, Mappy McMap of their very own in their home in Ireland. And it's been a project for them. And so dad, Michael, uh, gave me a more detailed look. He's a map maker, a map maker, apparently a professional map maker. So Michael and Ni, nee, you guys have two more colors to put on that map, but it's nice to see you're playing along here and making your own version of Mappy McMap there in uh, Trim, Ireland. So thank you. And thanks for the photos of the Giant's Causeway as well. He snuck a little thank you in there. Okay. So, are you veterans of the scene? Can you find our new terrains today? Well, of course. Look at that. Red is Celestia. So veterans of the series have been like, what, what about Celestia? Did you forget about Celestia? What, what's up? Why haven't you talked about Celestia? Haven't, you haven't talked about the Yellowstone hotspot. Why not? That's the only exotic terrain I know. Well, we saved it till the end. The fruitcake from Vinman's Bakery is a food analogy for all of the exotic terrains in the Pacific Northwest and stretching really from Alaska down to Mexico. Celestia is the last piece of the fruitcake, the last one to arrive. So we saved it till the end. This is the last weekend, is it not? So it's a big chunk of real estate, and on this map it looks a little bigger than it really is on the surface, and I'll explain in a second. But there's our red Celestia, and then it's kind of complicated in here. You're like, well, there's some red. Is that it? No, no, that was the Nanaimo, if you remember. That was Rose or something. Come on, that's red and that's Rose. Can't you tell the difference? I can't. Orange was Rangelia, if you recall. Oh, boy, what's this? A huge strike slip fault, mostly out in the water, called the Queen Charlotte Fault. Okay, that's going to play a part today. Because up here in Alaska, there's more red. Wait, I thought that was Celestia. It is. Are you saying this is Celestia too? Uh, essentially, yes. I'll explain. This is called the Yakutat. And there's some very common geology between the Yakutat in Alaska and Celestia in, east, in western Washington and western Oregon. But green was the other. What was it? Foliage green? The, so this is the Chugash. The Chugash terrain, which is inboard of the, of the uh, Yakutat. Green is inboard of red. And probably can't see it, but we lose the green here. But then if I, I can barely get it in, but in the very southern tip of Vancouver Island is a little bit more of that Chugash. So we have a little sliver of the green down here. Okay? So today is more than Celestia. It's looking at the evil twin of Celestia up in Alaska. And it's looking at the Chugash, which is sitting a little bit inboard of Celestia slash Yakutat. Good so far? Let's go to some custom maps. Before we do that, I forgot to do my intro folder. Does it really matter? Oh, maybe it doesn't. Hang on. Nah. Doesn't matter. I mean, I jumped right to folder one. I, I, I forgot to even do the intro because I know that there's going to be real open-ended stuff where we, and I got a lot of extra stuff in the cozy fort today as well. Okay. So we're in, I haven't even showed you the three acts, but I scrambled my plan this morning. So I don't even know what the three acts are. Okay. We're in, we're in act one, which is just trying to look at the nuts and bolts of these terrains. Okay. So we go back to roadside 
Geology of Washington, second edition, authored by Marley Miller and Daryl Cowan. Many of you have this now as a companion, and you've probably noticed we've gotten pretty deep into the weeds with a lot of uh, interesting discussion and current research going on. So we've almost left this book behind. Didn't mean to do that, but that's kind of where this we've kind of evolved in the last month. But if we go back to Marley and Daryl's book, we can see that, yeah, we had Quinellia to start, and we'll review all this on Sunday. But here's our Siletz terrain, or Siletzia, which is outboard of all the North Cascades mess, and inboard of some other stuff, which we may or may not talk about. But you remember our colors. What was it again? Red for Siletzia, green for the Chugash. Okay. Let's do red first. So we don't want to get hung up on some terms here. So some Washingtonians know crescent, the crescent formation or the crescent basalt. And yes, Siletzia is primarily 100% basalt. Siletzia is just a huge, large igneous province, a flood basalt region. So it's one kind of rock, basalt more or less. A little bit of sediment thrown in, which we'll talk about late today. But in Washington, this Siletzia exotic terrain is called Crescent. In Oregon, a bunch of those names are collectively called the Siletz River Volcanics. And up in British Columbia, that little sliver of Siletzia that's actually across the Strait of Juan de Fuca and on Vancouver Island, BC, it's called the Michosin, I hope, Michosin Basalt. So if you know these names, let's not get confused. Those are just different names for Siletzia. And you're like, well, why did they pick all these different names? Well, these were all names before the concept of Siletzia was established. And if we go back I mean, this is almost ancient history now. 1994, for goodness sake. I had just started at Central. And here's a little uh, collection of uh, papers on uh, you know, work done in the late 80s and early 1990s, and Scott Babcock and others from Western Washington University are talking about the crescent, quote-unquote, terrain. So just taking those old crescent names and those old formation names and then kind of making them work together as an exotic terrain is really not that old. I, I know I look old, and I guess I am old, and, and I was around when this was just kind of getting established, but really not that long ago when you think about it. We're going to have a video field report from Ralph and Winnie in Paulsbo, Washington. But in addition to their video field report, Ralph uh, mailed in a piece of, he mailed in a few pieces of Siletzia. But I think most of us know what basalt look like. And this is part of Siletzia from near Bremerton, Washington. I don't think I need to flip you around. You can kind of see it. Okay. So we're still just, the rocks don't change, right? The rocks don't change. The ideas change, as we'll see, but the rocks don't change. So we're just trying to kind of figuring out where is Siletzia, what kind of rock, get some ages, etc. So I've mentioned it's basalt. And if we cross from Washington into southern British Columbia, there's that sliver of Siletzia basalt near Victoria. Here's a sliver of Chugash. We don't know what that is yet, but I'll, I'll cut to the chase right now. The Chugash is an incredible variety of rock types, including a bunch of arcosic sandstone. Sound familiar? So... Uh, just an accretionary wedge or a melange is maybe the best way for us right now to visualize the Chugash. And what's orange? That's the Rangelia. You remember that was a huge oceanic plateau that came in, the Karmutsen basalt, etc. Now, if I mention basalt, let's not get confused, Washington people, Oregon people. The basalt we're talking about today, Siletzia, is between these two ages. 
The Silesia flood basalt started 56 million years ago and ended 48 million years ago. This is the age of the rock. This is the age of the terrain. You always remember now we have two ages for these exotic terrains. It's been a while since we've done this. What's the age of the rock? And then what's the age of accretion? That's a different age. I'm not talking about accretion. I'm just talking about the age of building this incredible pile of flood basalt. And was it built here? No. It was built out in the water. So this is truly an exotic terrain. But I'm including on this map a, a, a flood basalt map I've used for years. This is the German chocolate cake. This is the, like the part of the fruit cake with the German chocolate cake sitting on top. I'm getting hungry now. These are not exotic basalts. These are, look at the age, very young compared to the age of the Silesia. And in fact, they overlap and flow over parts of what is considered Silesia. So we have a lot of flood basalt in the Pacific Northwest. There are two main stories, not one. We don't want to combine those stories. So if you're driving down the Yakima River Canyon Road tomorrow and all the fog and the ice and everything and the hoarfrost, and you see a bunch of basalt, I don't want you to be thinking Silesia. Silesia is confined to uh, essentially west of the Cascades, west of the Cascades. But it's not just west of the Cascades. If we then go up to Alaska, there's more Silesia basalt. But it's not called Silesia basalt up there. It's called the Yakutat. And that's one of my major about faces mid-morning. There's more to the Yakutat than the flood basalt. That's new to me like five hours ago or whatever. So I need to fold that in. But for now, let's just realize that this is the evil twin. This is, this is the flood basalt that's from the Silesia story that now is way up here in Alaska. And then here's our Chugash, which so far all we know is kind of a complicated accretionary wedge. And then yellow and orange are part of the insular superterrain that we talked about before. You see some places that you know, Sitka and, and Baranoff Island and Kodiak Island, you've heard of, at least I have. Uh, maybe you have too. I know I've only been to Alaska for one weekend, so I don't know much about this at all. And I am highlighting some plutons in maroon here. And I screwed this one up, so I just colored this black. The plutons are only invading the Chugash. And there's an interesting age progression from Sanak Island, 63 million year old pluton, down to Baranoff Island 47. So just put that in the back of your mind. We're gonna use it uh, when things get wild here in a bit. Okay? Now, don't we need our normal look at the box? Boxy McBox or whatever the hell we called it? Sorry, Patrick. So it's been a while since we've looked at this. This was how we plotted all of our exotic terrains. Uh, as we worked our way in British Columbia and then we swung down into the Crystalline Core, the North Cascades, etc. This is all, we'll try to revisit this somehow on Sunday. I still don't know how, but I ran, again, I, I got to squeeze it in. I like ran out of room. So here's our Chugash today. Pretty tough to get ages. And I think I maybe know why, because there's such a complicated mosaic of material thrown into the blender, and also I just ran out of time, but uh, it wasn't obvious what the age range was, but what I could find, it looked like there was an interesting uh, similarity to something called the Melange Belt, like the Western Melange Belt that we talked about east of downtown Seattle. More coming on that in a second. There's the Nanaimo, which was just there before, innocently just minding its own business, and then I just, I just tossed in Silesia. Uh, which can also be considered Yakutat. But now remember, I, I got breaking news. I can't just do this for Yakutat, which I didn't realize when I made this thing last night. So let me give you a little bit more um, data, easy to read. Believe it or not, we're in the well-behaved part. It's gonna, I'm starting to sweat already. I can tell it's going to get wild here. So I took those two boxes that I just gave you, and I, I don't know if this is much different, but I've just kind of 
Celestia's uh, outboard of the Chugash. And again, this is my best attempt. I may be off here, but this is my best attempt to give an age range for the material that's within the Chugash. It's one of those melanges, man. Especially lower in the section, it's a bunch of melange. There's a bunch of blue schist within it. Uh, before I forget, there's the Baranoff schist. Oh boy. And the Leech River schist uh, that will play a part. Uh, Daryl Cowan did a famous paper on that back in 2003. And then as we get younger in the Chugash, things get a little bit different and a little bit more well-behaved. And there's a lot of our Kosick sandstone layers with some shale layers. There's a talk of flysh. There's a turbidity currents and some deep water. Uh, but it's a collection of sedimentary rocks for the most part. That's not quite as complicated as far as a melange story in the upper or youngest part of the Chugash than it is down below. I'm setting you up for our big discussion. And then you can see the Siletz, our Siletzia story is rather precise. We begin that flood basalt creation 56 million years ago and we stop at 48 million years ago. And I tossed in sediments because in the Cozy Fort we'll visit with some young geologists who are working with some sediments on top of Siletzia. Uh, now, I am sweating, why am I sweating? Bijou, why am I sweating? Um, so I didn't know much about Siletzia until five years ago. And I was sent a paper, one of my favorite papers, I think of all time. And it's this here. So this is Ray Wells, United States Geological Survey, published in 2014 and got to me a year later. And this was kind of an end of career kind of a thing, as I understand it. Ray was about to retire from the USGS and he took his whole career's worth of work and compiled it into this amazing paper, Geologic History of Silesia. And the, it works for me, the images are wonderful, it's chock full of details, but also plugs into a regional story involving clockwise rotation and other things. And it even impacts much of the geology north of Ellensburg in central Washington. So I started emailing with uh, Ray Wells in 2015. And, you know, big fan of your paper, and I have a couple of final uh, follow-up questions. Uh, he's got another paper that's another all-time favorite of mine that's not related at all to our story today. Well, it is kind of, but I, I'll ignore it. But I love this paper as well. This is a very short one. So I basically said, Ray, uh, I'm a big fan, and I want to learn more, and I just can't get enough of your work. And he said... Oh boy, and we're going to start the wildness right off the bat. I can't find that. I'll paraphrase. He said, thanks a lot. And I think I was writing a little script for a, a video series I was doing, and I wanted to include some of that. And so he was very kind to spend some time to read the script and gave me some suggestions on how to change. Related to Silesia. But the thing that really fired me up about that paper is he was the first guy talking about the Yellowstone hotspot. 56 million years ago in the Pacific. And I kind of ignored everything else related to that in the paper. I just focused on that Yellowstone hotspot. And I'm like, I mean, I did my master's thesis on the Yellowstone hotspot in Southern Idaho. So I was always taught and I, always, I think I wrote in my thesis that the Yellowstone hotspot started 17 million years ago in Northern Nevada. And so here's this guy talking about the Yellowstone hotspot being a thing, a fixed mantle plume out in the Pacific, burning a hole in the Pacific Ocean floor and making this incredible oceanic plateau from Ray's paper, Ray Wells's paper. Here's this massive oceanic plateau built between 56 and 48 million years old. And then all this stuff that's happened since that time. If I get serious about doing another live stream series, I don't know if I will or not, but if I do next year, let's say, I'll probably just zero in on the most recent 50 million years and all the absolute circus-like behavior that's been going on in the Pacific Northwest since 
and during Seleucia's accretion. But that's not our topic today. Our focus is on Seleucia itself. And Ray had images like this, which blew me away. So he says, look, here's, look at how big Seleucia is. It's mostly underground. It's making up a large portion of Western Washington and Western Oregon. We have the geophysics to prove it. This is Seleucia we're talking about. A huge oceanic plateau that was created out in the water by the Yellowstone hotspot was one of the main thrusts of the paper and then was added to the edge of Washington and Oregon. And, and that was a major exotic terrain. I mean, it's just barely an exotic terrain. It's not way out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, but technically it was created in the ocean and brought in and added. And it was a monster real estate gain for the Pacific Northwest. So essentially everything west of the crest of the Cascades has a Seleucia flood basalt basement. You're going to have to be patient with me today. This does kind of a nice job of showing areas where Seleucia is at the surface, but then how big Seleucia is in the subsurface. Today, I'm not talking about out in the water now. This is just like how much, these are the places you can go visit Seleucia. We got two field reports today uh, with a couple of, of uh, couples going directly to Seleucia exposure, and when they find exposures of Seleucia basalt in western Washington or western Oregon, in many places they find pillow basalts, which most of us know. Pillow basalts tell us that there was basaltic eruption into water, and since we're talking about a massive oceanic plateau, we're talking about the building of Seleucia from the ocean floor and pillowing as that lava is fighting the water of the Pacific Ocean, starting 56 million years ago. There's other places that you have beautiful columnar basalt, which at first glance looks like that's a portion of Seleucia that must be above sea level. And there is places, there are places where Seleucia is above sea level, but apparently the interpretation here in the Willapa Hills is that this is a a filled lava tube where you have columns. I don't know if we're on top of the, I guess we are subaerial there now that I think about it, okay? Now, Mike Eddy, who's really the star of the show today, I'm jumping ahead, but just to, I'll, I'll give you the backstory on him in a second. This is a paper three years ago from Michael Eddy. He's also showing the size of Seleccia in Western Washington. He's showing us that it's not all of Western Washington. There's yellow here. Did you notice that on Mappy McMap? Uh, this is still white. And that's because Seleccia has been folded on its head and behind it is younger sediment that's been brought in and is not technically an exotic terrain. It's just a bunch of subduction complex stuff that's come in. So that doesn't have a technical exotic terrain name. But the main thing I wanted to show you from this, from Mike Eddy, I think this is 2017. I'll show you all the papers in just a second. Uh, that when you find this Seleccia basalt, locally called the Crescent basalt, he's got, what's his key here? Right. His pink is the submarine or pillow, pillowed uh, Seleccia basalt. But then this color is a part of Seleccia that's above water. So Seleccia did build big enough off of the ocean floor starting 56 million years ago off the coast of the Pacific Northwest to eventually get big enough to break the waves and got its chin up above sea level. And it was a island that you could have lived on off the coast of Oregon, let's say, 52 million years ago. Okay, so, and, and even across the water into southern uh, BC, we've got that same story. Now, if we jump up to Alaska just briefly, this is the same flood basalt material called the Yakutat, which most everybody agrees was created at the same place and the same time as Seleccia down south. 
And so here's the northern version, the Alaskan twin of Silesia that is still being sent north and is still accreting. So here's a part where we're young enough that we have an active plate pushing uh, an, an exotic terrain further and further into the underbelly of Alaska. And so the fruitcake is still being assembled up in Alaska. Not quite the order I wanted, but I think I'm getting my point across. Uh, the Olympic Peninsula, I think, you know, many that watch this series are like, finally, the guy's talking about Silesia. At least I know about that one. Why isn't he talking about it? Well, we're waiting until late. But then a lot of people live in western Washington, and people know this story. If they know the basalt, the crescent formation, they've been on Hurricane Ridge Road. We'll go to it in the Cozy Fort on the way up to Olympic National Park. That's part of this story. And then here's all this material that has been brought in since the accretion of Silesia. This is more complicated than we need probably, but within Silesia, according to Ray Wells, this is again from this famous paper in 2014, there's a bunch of cracks that are filled with young lava. They're called dikes. Uh, that's not so important for us, but the orientation of the dikes are. So this is younger than 50 million years ago. We're, we're forming cracks and we're filling the cracks with lava. But the point is, we all know about the clockwise rotation. And even though all these cracks today in Silesia are oriented like this, we can take GPS and Merle Beck's paleomagnetism and other studies to restore those uh, dikes back to their original orientation when they were active. And that's only worth mentioning right now because if we restore the coastline to when the Silesia terrain came in, it's a different oriented coastline than we have today. That's a minor point today. There's our Columbia embayment, let's not get sidetracked, but that's an area of this that I need to learn more about. So I haven't given you the date of accretion yet, I wanna do it right now. And I'll use a prop just to help you. This Silesia large igneous province, oh no, I've, I've got a sketch for you. Dry mouth. We doing okay? Basically trying to psych myself up for this. I'm building it up too much. Now it's not gonna be that wild, but I have no idea how it's going to work. I'll save showing you these papers. Um, if you want to call this act two, it'll be very brief, but let's do it. So taking that Ray Wells paper and the idea that the Yellowstone hotspot was offshore of the Pacific Northwest. Not everybody buys it, by the way, but let's run with it. We're gonna make this huge island of basalt in the water between 56 and 48 million years. And here's a rustic sourdough loaf that I picked up at Vinman's Bakery in downtown Ellensburg. This episode of Nick From Home brought to you by Vinman's Bakery. You gotta love it. And this is gonna be our Silesia, okay? When did this flood basalt begin? 56. When did it stop erupting? 48. No older than 56, no younger than 48. Okay? You've seen this a number of times. Can I do it without a big glare? He asks himself. Kinda. So this, of course, is a diagram showing clockwise rotation of the Pacific Northwest crust. But before we start doing all the clockwise rotation, let's have the Yellowstone hotspot off the coast of Northern California. You're looking down on the rustic sourdough loaf, which is our Silesia. And 
as this thing is still being built and still erupting, it's being sent to the northeast and it accretes starting 51 million years ago. Start to build the loaf 56. Possibly it becomes above sea level roughly 51-ish, about the time that we are accreting Celestia to Washington and Oregon. So it's not a direct eastward movement. It's an oblique subduction of the ocean plate, bringing Celestia in, and it's not going to kiss the shore. It's going to absolutely deform. We're going to have an oroclinal bend. We're going to take that former coastline and we're going to bend it. We're going to, it's like a fender bender. Uh, up to 20 degrees away from its original alignment, we're going to have this accretion of Celestia uh, and, and add all that real estate. That's going to create a bunch of trauma as far inland as Ellensburg, Washington. So that brings up Mike Eddy. So when I was visiting by email with Ray Wells, he said, you really should know about this guy, Mike Eddy. He's at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and he's adding a bunch more detail to the Silesia story. And there's a paper in press that he's doing right now with Sam Bowering and others. And uh, he's working with the Swak Formation and the Tianaway feeder dikes, just north of your town. This is Ray Wells talking to me. You gotta you got get, get, get in touch with Mike Eddy, would you? And so I did. And Mike helped me quite a bit. But he put together some really interesting fine-tuned details on the accretion of Silesia. Hang on, Patrick. Finally found what I was looking for. So Wells says, a new paper in review is by Eddie et al. from MIT, uh, provides uranium lead ages for all the Tianaway, Roslyn, Chuckanut, and Chumstick arcosis and interbedded volcanics. They nicely, this is Ray Wells talking to me in 2015. They nicely document the sequence of deposition and volcanism and show that folding of that sequence matches the timing of Celestia collision and accretion. It is an important paper. It's like, whoa, this guy's about ready to retire. And here's this young guy who's like still in his 20s, Michael Eddy. And, and this, this, this old guy's like, this is an important paper. I'm like, whoa, really? So I really was, was fine tuned and ready to read as much as I could. And Mike sent me a preprint and we went back and forth a little bit. So back in the day, a few years ago, I had a sketch going like this, where I'm like, okay, and these dates are a little different now, it's 48 now, but okay, we, we got Celestia, and I was originally, originally visualizing Celestia out here off the coast of Washington and Oregon. I now realize it was down off the coast of California. There's 14 times the volume of basalt in Celestia than there is all of the German chocolate cake. And I'm going quickly now because I've already given a lecture on this, a couple of lectures, a couple of live streams on this. This is old hat to me now. So as soon as I got this data from these guys, I ran with it. There's one called uh, Liberty Gold and the Yellowstone Hotspot. And I was just basically taking Mike Eddy and Ray Wells' work and spinning it for a general audience. And I did make some cartoons just to do this very quickly, and then we're on to the brand new stuff from the uh, mental shuffling a few hours ago. Um, this is essentially what I did in this Yellowstone Liberty Gold lecture. that You can find it on YouTube. It went okay. So the Yellowstone hotspot, according to Wells and others, and I think Mike Eddy is now mostly on board with that, the Yellowstone hotspot has built this Celestia very quickly, 56 million years ago, and we're going to send it towards the Pacific Northwest. I just told you verbally, but now I'll show you between 51 and 49 is our major dates of accretion. And Mike Eddy is the guy taking all sorts of trauma further inland and seeing folding and faulting and fissures being opened up orthogonal to this compression direction, to actually parallel to this compression direction to show that 
story. But notice the Yellowstone hotspot isn't just going to shut off. It did its work out in the water. And now this is Paul Hammond and others from Portland State saying, how about if we just keep that Yellowstone hotspot uh, going as a big old blowtorch? Now remember now, the mantle plumes are fixed as we understand them. And so what's really changing is the Pacific Northwest is dragging to the Southwest over that stationary plume. Did you see what I did there? I did these a half an hour ago quickly in the basement, but I think, I think they're mostly what I want to do. So we're quite a ways between the shore and Yellowstone hotspot. And now by 50, uh, we have the Yellowstone hotspot slipping beneath this, although we're choking the trench with this huge oceanic plateau. And then the idea I've been peddling for years, last four years basically, is that you're eventually going to get Yellowstone where it belongs, the Yellowstone hotspot where it belongs, because North America continued to drift to the southwest over the top of it. And instead of a linear trail of older calderas, we have the oldest calderas being moved by the clockwise rotation. Places like Smith Rock and the Crooked River Caldera are part of that story, but everything's been oriented differently or moved off of its original linear alignment. If, you're, if your brow is furrowed right now, I guess you got homework. Yeah, there, there's, there's stuff I've already done online that kind of tells that story. But that is the Celestia story that I've been using for the last four years. You're ready to make a big line. And we're going to cross over into virgin territory for me as well as for you. Oh, one final thing. Just a nice little personal touch. I posted that lecture on Yellowstone hotspot and the clockwise rotation and all that. And I got an email in December of 2016. Professor Zentner, my son, Michael Eddy, sent me a note regarding you mentioning him in your Yellowstone lecture earlier this year. Being a typical parent, I had to see it on YouTube. Nice things, nice things. Keep up the great work. Teachers make a huge difference in this world. Ralph R. Eddy Jr. So I'm like, I like this family. I like this guy, Mike Eddy. His dad's watching stuff and sending me a nice little note. Okay. So before I get into the gory details here, I think it was Wednesday, two days ago, that I felt like, oh, you know, I'll just mail it in. I didn't really say that, but I thought, you know, I know the Celestia story. I don't have to do a ton of prep here. I can just kind of, you know, mostly do what I've done before. And I'll, I'll toss in some new stuff here and there. And I emailed Mike Eddy. And I emailed Jeff Tepper. And I emailed John Garver, a former Daryl Cowan student, and a few others, just looking for a couple of new little things I could add to this lecture, especially involving the Chugash. And that stuff came in in the last 48 hours. And Mike in particular, Michael Eddy, sent this long email. And I want to share that email with you. And I want to share... Confusion is the wrong word, but it's an exciting uh, difference of opinion between basically three different groups beyond the very simple Yellowstone hotspot story that I've shared with you to this point. And it's going to involve the Chugash. It's going to involve the Western Melange Belt. Hell, it's going to involve the Polona Schist that Chris showed us down outside of Los Angeles last time. Okay. So before I get too far off the rails, let me show you more papers that you can read this work uh, directly for yourself. I showed you this one. Michael Eddy. These are not in order now, I'm sorry, I'm all, I'm all scrambled. Many of you were very excited about the resurrection plate and this new paper that came out this fall, a team from the University of Houston. Michael Eddy and John Garver and a few others are not even sure the resur resurrection plate existed. If you want a little taste that, as to what's coming. Like, this is amazing work, uh, video and everything, and, and, and some groups who are thinking a lot about this are like, I'm not even sure that... 
So if you want this to be tidied up in a nice little bow for Christmas and Batsaletsia, that's not what you're going to get. You're going to get a wide open. These are the directions that you'll probably read about in the next 10 years involving this topic. Uh, Mike Eddy, uh, three years ago, his most recent uh, talk of something called a triple junction. That'll be the focal point of the last part of this. It's almost, I got to move it along. Move it along, boy. John Garver, uh, 2015, publishing about the Chugash. And what I have to share with you is some new stuff that John Garver has not published yet but was kind enough to share a few slides from a talk he gave last year in Phoenix. Another paper on the Chugash with John Garver and Cam Davidson on, uh, we'll not get into the weeds here, but more on the Chugash. I feel like I just need to do a look, couple more of these. So there's more from Michael Eddy on Celestia and the timing of accretion. Okay. Let me give it to you verbally. Let's see if this works. Spitballing now. Let me give it to you verbally and then I'll try to show you, I'll try to stay along that narrative. The next 15 minutes will be like this. It's more than a Yellowstone hotspot story there was a spreading ridge out in the Pacific at that time. And most everybody agrees that that spreading ridge was subducting beneath North America. Then I'll go to that spreading ridge intersecting the coastline of North America. How has that spreading ridge been migrating as it subducts beneath North America. One group thinks that that spreading ridge between the Kula and the Farallon plate long ago, that spreading ridge was once upon a time subducting down as far south as Mexico or Southern California. And then that spreading ridge was migrating northward between 80 and 40 million years ago. Sound familiar? That was our last session, essentially Baja BC. There's another group, or it might just be one person, Michael Eddy, who says, I, I don't see it moving northward. I, I see that triple junction. I see that spreading ridge drifting south. And I'm emailing back and forth like, what? What is this guy talking about? Like everybody really respects Michael Eddy, but why is he talking about a, a, a spreading ridge migrating south during this time? Everybody else says it's moving north. And both of those groups don't believe that the resurrection plate was ever a thing. And this new discovery of finding a piece of the resurrection plate in the subsurface was not the resurrection plate, it's something else. I don't know what to do with that. But if you're pumped to learn about the resurrection plate, it's not coming. That's a big question mark. But there's question marks even between these two groups. That was my attempt to do it verbally. Let me try to do it graphically with the rustic sourdough. So let's see, right? Right. Used to be out in the water, right? Right. Used to look like this. Correct. But it wasn't just one basic Farallon plate out there coming at North America. We've already discussed that. We've already discussed that the old fashioned model of just one big Farallon plate moving eastward and subducting, almost everybody agrees that's not a thing anymore. You tweak it here and there, but just to have this massive Farallon plate moving straight east and subducting, nobody's into that anymore for a bunch of new geologic evidence, geologic reasons. But the question is, was our Celestia created by the Yellowstone hotspot and was the Yellowstone hotspot right on this spreading ridge between the Kula and the Farallon plate? And you're like, well, how, how, how would you not know that? You know everything you need to know about the Celestia story, right? Right. Well, this has all been destroyed. 
The spreading ridge has been subducted. The Kula plate is totally gone. There's just a little bit of the Farallon plate. That's called the Juan de Fuca plate. But if you go back dozens of millions of years ago, it's very difficult to reconstruct this. And this is the essential disagreement. This is called a triple junction. Well, this is a triple junction. We have three ocean plates touching each other. That's what a triple junction means. Triple junction, three plates touching each other with one finger point. But this is not the triple junction that's the debatable topic right now. The triple junction that we're discussing now is North America touching the Kula and the Farallon, which I'll do in just a second. But are you with me? Can we take, it's not like the Yellowstone hotspot story is wrong. It's not that the Yellowstone hotspot story timing is wrong. It's just that I conveniently, this is me, conveniently four years ago just ignored the spreading ridge. I just focused on the, the big loaf of bread out in the water coming in. But if the loaf of bread is straddling this spreading ridge, maybe we're eventually splitting the loaf Sending half up to Alaska and ke keeping half down here. Do you see how complicated this can get in a hurry? Okay, I'm done with the bread. Before this morning, here's what I was sure I was going to do with you. Explain what I thought was everybody's agreement on the triple junction migration. Or more specifically this spreading ridge between the, essentially the northward moving Kula plate and the eastward moving Farallon plate. What do I have here? I've got North America. Sorry, it's not fresh baked pizza. Okay, so we go Mexico, Western US, Ellensburg, the center of the universe, and Canada. Here is our three spreading ridges, three ocean plates offshore of Western North America. But we're just focusing on this guy here, and I think it's gonna be easiest for us, and this may even be real, that this spreading ridge is gonna be fixed. It's not gonna move. So I'm gonna get it set up right here, and I'm not gonna move the whiteboard, okay? I'm gonna keep it right by my chin, okay? Spreading Kula plates, spreading Farallon plates. And if you take these vectors together, it's essentially Farallon's coming right at North America and Kula's going north. So this is a big comment, a big point that Mike Eddy's email I'm about to read to you that was written yesterday. He keeps saying if you're a portion of Washington or Oregon that's in direct contact with the Farallon, you have mostly subduction coming at you. But if at a different time and you are part of Washington or Oregon that's north of this spreading center and you have the Kula right offshore, then you've got major northward movement, Baja BC, okay? So the concept from John Garver, Daryl Cowan, and other translation type folks, maximum translation folks, like 3,000 kilometers or more, if you've got stuff that you think was in, originally in Southern California and it's now in frickin' Alaska, that's almost 4,000 kilometers of translation. You better have the Kula connected to you for a hell of a long time. Sorry, Patrick. So as I understood it, I thought until this morning, there's going to be a northward drift of this spreading ridge. 80 million years ago, it's going to be down by Mexico. And I'm going to keep the whiteboard fixed, but I'm going to bring in North America towards the southwest. And if all I'm doing is drifting the cardboard southwest, that spreading ridge is going to migrate northward. Do you see what I'm doing? I'm going to do it again. But we're looking at the position of the West Coast and where it intersects this uh, frickin' oceanic highway that I've drawn with the dotted line down the middle, okay? And I'll narrate with ages now. I assume you can hear me when my mouth is behind the, the cardboard. 80 million years ago, look at how much of Kula 
is in direct contact with Western North America. 80 million years ago, 70 million years ago. That's where Will Matthews had the Mojave breach, by the way, last time. 60 million years ago. About 55 million years ago, this spreading ridge is trending northeast and it's subducting beneath the, oh, I forgot to do the drift, sorry. 80, 70, 60, 50, 40, it's subducting beneath Canada. And again, the main point is, notice uh, if you're on the edge of the cardboard and you are no longer in, in direct contact with the Kula, but suddenly you're in direct contact with the Farallon, that's going to have a major impact on what's happening on your coastline. One more time, if you're touching the Kula, the Kula's moving north, and so there's going to be portions of the western edge of North America sheared off and sent towards Alaska. But if you're a portion of the uh, edge of the cardboard that happens to be now south of this spreading ridge, you're going to have subduction, more or less. And the fair line is going to be coming at you uh, west to east. 80, 70, 60, 50, 40. A northward migration of the spreading ridge subducting beneath the west coast of North America. I'm moving on. I may have lost most of you, I don't know, but we're going to move on. What did I say, 15 minutes? We'll keep rolling. So here's the same thing in three panels for you, more or less. I don't think I need to narrate, do I? You're like, well, I'll narrate this way. You're like, who, who cares? What's the difference? Well. New work that's happening right now may bolster the case for Baja BC or put the brakes on some of it. This has always been a problem. You know, and as I was putting lectures together over the last two years, I Googled Kula Plate and I'd see like 72 different maps, sometimes from the same, you know, this is what the Kula Plate looked like 40 million years ago. There's like 42 different versions. Like, it's hard to reconstruct this exactly. But this is showing a northward drift of this line up the west coast of North America. Remember what Michael Eddy is saying. He said, I'm not sure it moved north. I think it moved south. Oh, yeah, Yellowstone hotspot. Okay, so let's see if fine. Yep, okay. Oh, so if the Yellowstone hotspot straddles the spreading ridge and the spreading ridge is subducting beneath the Pacific Northwest and half of the loaf of bread is on the Kula, then we're going we're gonna to split the loaf right down the middle, aren't we? And isn't that half of the loaf going to be Yakutat and go to Alaska and the other half be more directly subducted uh, and accreted to Pacific Northwest? Yes, that's the general idea. Back to Ray Wells, he had, he wasn't sure, he had different scenarios. Yellowstone hotspot straddling, Yellowstone hotspot totally on the Farallon, like he had three different possible positions. But everything in pink is this incredible Silesia that uh, apparently these age ranges don't work anymore. But we're basically accreting this entire monster, but, but a significant part of the monster has been removed and sent north, the Yakutat. Different scenarios. Maybe the loaf was not centered on the spreading ridge. Maybe it was mostly on the Farallon. And maybe the Farallon brought the whole loaf to Washington and Oregon. And then there was a um, uh, strike slip faulting just tore part of the uh, loaf away, as opposed to splitting it. Skip it, I'll just, I'll just play with it. So just trying to, I'm, I'm about to go to the advanced stuff here. This is not advanced yet, whatever. 
Remember, this is a map that I liked from Will Matthews, who I heard from, by the way, after Sunday's show. He said, I watch part of Sunday's show. I just don't have two hours to watch. I wish I had two hours. I don't have two hours to watch you on a Sunday morning. I totally get it. But he saw the part where I shared this and he had a couple extra things to add. But for the most part, he's got that same spreading. This is the spreading words we're talking about. But we're talking about it long before Seletia. Remember, Seletia is going to form. That's a whole other question. Why did, why did the Yellowstone hotspot suddenly appear 56 million years ago and make Seletia? Is there an older story somehow? Let's not go there. But yes, he has that same spreading ridge at the Polona Schist and creating that Mojave breach. And Stacia Gordon and Kristen Sauer have that same spreading ridge, whatever dates those are, 85 to 74, Southern Cal, and then sending this stuff north. But before I got into the weeds with these guys this week, this is what I drew for myself, what was it, early March, before everything went to hell worldwide. I was trying to put together a demise of the Farallon Plate lecture and I was trying to draw this business. Now the idea is if you have a spreading ridge subducting, you're gonna create what's called a slab gap and you're gonna have volcanism forming in this gap because we're not subducting a plate right here, right? We're subducting a spreading ridge like the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, but it's, it's perpendicular to the coastline. So the volcanic arc is going to have, have a big gap in it, and there's going to be some um, upper mantle mag generated magmas that are going to form very close to the trench. They're called near trench magmas. And that's some of the best evidence we have for where a subducting ridge used to be. Boy, oh boy, what have we gotten into here? We got more than 800. I guess you're not super turned off. Here's Mike showing all sorts of feeder dikes opening up in, uh, inland of this uh, trauma from accreting Seletia. But we're not only bringing Seletia in, we're apparently subducting the trench at the same time. Sorry. We're also subducting the ocean spreading center at the same time. And so there's other sorts of um, developments, shall we say, in, inland. Like what? Jeff Tepper from the University of Puget Sound. I'll cut to it. And this is what I was really hot on uh, over the, this past winter because I heard Jeff speak in Portland at a, at a talk. And he was talking about all these crazy magmas that are popping up about the time of Seletia accretion. Here's the loaf coming in. And we're kind of sh shutting off a well-behaved cascade-like volcanic arc because this whole thing is just choking the subduction zone. And instead, there's this like, everything just goes berserk from here all the way back to the Dakotas. And these really weird magmas are popping up everywhere, including some well-known places. So I was taking Jeff's work. Isn't this all cute? It's all so folksy. I was using colored pencils even before the live streams, ladies and gentlemen. So I was taking all of Jeff's magmas from that age, and he's got a story of slab rollback, et cetera, which we don't have time for. But he and Ken Clark and Mike, Eddie, are trying to reconstruct the details of what it looked like. This is Jeff Tepper primarily. 52 million years ago, the Seletsi is coming in. 49 million years ago, it's accreted for the most part. There's our spreading ridge coming in behind it. Weird stuff going on. Slab curtain, which I knew hardly anything about a year ago, and now I know quite a bit more about tomography. Okay, you get the message. So you'd think we're about done, but we're not. The final two chapters... I don't know how long it's going to take, but I just, as long as I got a battery, I'm going to keep going. The final two chapters, the final two piles here are Michael Eddy, now, and John Garver, now. Not sure about northward 
migration, in fact, maybe southward migration, like he's got it. This is a nice summary slide. Michael Eddy, his most recent paper on this. There's our spreading ridge. There's Silesia. Here's the Chugash, which we haven't even talked much about yet. But he says, southward migration of triple junction. I'm like, what? I don't get it. I thought everybody thought this, this spreading ridge was migrating north. Mike, why are you saying the thing's drifting to the south? I'll share that with you, and then we'll finish before we go in the Cozy Fort with John Garver, who has a northward migrating spreading ridge and evidence for that. Probably bit off too much to chew here today, but I don't know what, I must have slept well or something, I don't know. Okay. I'm not going to read, it's a three-page email, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but this was sent uh, on Wednesday. Let me, I, I grabbed a few, a few highlights for you. Mike Eddy, he's just finishing up the semester at Purdue University. The simplest geometry of the kula Farallon pacific triple junction would put the Kula and Farallon Ridge striking northeast and intersecting North America in the Pacific Northwest somewhere between Alaska and, let's say, Northern California. So Mike says, I don't know where that spreading ridge was intersecting uh, the West Coast. We know it can't be further north than that. It can't be further south than that, according to Mike. Now, according to John Garver, it, is, it, it was intersecting further south, but that's Mike's reasoning. He's got a bunch of reasoning that I don't have time to share with you. But I do want to share this. The best way, this is Mike Eddy talking to me on Wednesday, the best way to con constrain the position of a ridge trench trench or ridge trench transform triple junction is identifying near trench magmatism. The forearc is typically a very cold place because it's insulated from the upper mantle by the subducting slab. However, if you have a ridge Intersecting a subduction zone, a slab gap inevitably forms, and the forearc is exposed to high temperatures due to the proximity of the upper mantle and the intrusion of lots of basaltic melts that form as the mantle upwells through the slab gap. There are two locations in the Pacific Northwest where near trench intrusions occur. The Sanak Baranoff Plutonic Belt is one of them. Well, do you remember? Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Hang on, Patrick. Fezier, did you take it? Oh, shit. Sorry, Patrick. Got it, it was worth the wait. So I included these near-trench plutons, very carefully studied by John Garver, and also incorporated in a very exciting 2003 paper by your own Daryl Cowan. And they're saying that these near-trench plutons are not from subduction of an oceanic plate. These near-trench plutons are a direct result of a slab gap. Basically, these magmas here at Sanak Island are 63 million years old because the ocean ridge was subducting here 63, was subducting here 61. These are the upper mantle leaks coming up through the slab gap. And the obvious question is, why do we have an age progression then? I'm taking a break from Mike's email. I don't know if that's good news or not. Very exciting email. One of my most favorite emails of the last couple of years. I just had it. Hang on. Yep. So Daryl Cowan says he happened to use green for Chugash. Daryl says, here's the Chugash today and the near trench 
plutons. But Daryl says, how about if we uh, unkink this thing and send it a little bit further south? Like, let's say 50 million years ago, here's the spreading ridge. Here's the slab gap. We're going to make some near trench plutons at Baranoff Island. And if we move this whole skinny hot dog further south, further back in time, that trench is going to be here and here and here. Can you see it in visual? If we take this green hot dog, I don't want to say green bean, that's too confusing. If we take this green hot dog, green hot dog, what? If I take this green hot dog and move it north, these, this age progression of these near trench magmas can confirm that there was a major amount of northward translation of the Chugash terrain. Hang in there, I hope you're still with me. Back to Mike's email. There are two locations of these near trench, near -trench intrusions. The 60 to 50 million year old Sanak Baranoff plutonic belt, which intrudes the Chugash terrain in southern Alaska, and 52 to 49 million year old intrusions and volcanics on Vancouver Island in northwest Washington. Both belts of near trench intrusions show time transgressive relationships. If you unbend the Alaska Oroclon and permit the Chugash terrain to slide along the continental margin from an originally more southern location, then both belts of near trench intrusions could record north to south age progression. So, so far, so good. He's agreeing with Daryl and um, uh, John Garver. But here's why Mike Eddy, and I'll, I'll leave it alone after this, here's why Mike Eddy likes the ridge drifting south as opposed to north, um, at least younger than 50. There's quite a bit of discussion as to whether the Chugash terrain and the rest of southern Alaska has been translated to the north. If it has been moved by a few thousand kilometers, then you can link the two belts of near trench magmatism pretty nicely. And the gap in the Paleocene-Eocene near trench magmatism in British Columbia simply represents the area where the Chugash terrain once lay. That's Daryl. In this case, my preferred model, the North American Kula Farallon Triple Junction intersected the Chugash terrain off of BC by 60 million years ago and slowly migrated to the south. The parts of North America that found themselves on the northern arm of this triple junction were exposed to the strong dextral right lateral component of motion between the Kula and North America and were likely translated to the north. This provides a simple mechanism for moving southern Alaska. Alternatively, if southern Alaska has not been significantly translated to the north, then you are left with needing to invoke yet another oceanic plate that has been fully subducted. So if you like the resurrection plate, you don't like Baja BC, as I understand it. You come up with this whole other ocean plate that is totally subducted to explain that gap. But here's the crux of why Mike Eddy is not so sure that this triple junction has been migrating to the north for the last 40 million years. Still Mike Eddy talking. In Washington, we record a dramatic change to large offset right lateral strike slip faulting at 49 million years ago based on the opening of the Chumstick Basin, that's central Washington. Stratigraphic correlations across the Straight Creek Fault, you know about that. Prior to 49, there's evidence for some right lateral strike slip faulting in the Cascades, but no strong evidence for large offset that I am aware of. So to me, so he's, so Mike is working with these known strike slip faults. Remember we restored the fruitcake? He's working with these known strike slip faults, working with the timing of the offset on those faults and saying that most of the offset is younger than 49. So to me, it would appear that prior to 49 million years ago, Washington was adjacent to the Farallon plate and that after 49, Washington was adjacent to the Kula. Either case requires a southward migrating triple junction. This is also consistent 
with an age progression of near-trench intrusions on Vancouver Island, I don't even really know where those are, that shows southward younging from 52 to 49. Certainly for this narrow window of time, I don't know how you'd get either triple junction to, to you, I don't know how you get either triple junction to migrate along the continental margin to the north. Okay, there's more, but I, I, I can't, I, I can feel it slipping away here for some reason. I'll finish with three images from Mike Eddy's group, and then I, I got to do a little bit of John Garber stuff because he was so kind to, to share some of his work. Um, you're going to meet in the Cozy Fort Aaron Donahue, who is uh, the current PhD student of Mike at Purdue. And in that little interview that I did with those guys, they were talking about working with sedimentary layers on top of Silesia. Here's Aaron by email yesterday. For my PhD project, I'm inter interested in determining if the Cenozoic sedimentary cover of Silesia and Yucatan ever recorded a unified depositional system. If Yucatan and Silesia formed adjacent to each other over the same spreading ridge, the loaf, I would expect that the oldest sediments deposited on both Yakutat and Silesia terrains possibly record similar depositional environments that could be linked to each other. At some later point, Yakutat split off from Silesia and was then transported northward along the Queen Charlotte Fault to its current position where it's colliding with southeastern Alaska today. I won't go into specific formation names and linkages in Alaska as it's too premature scientifically and we are too far away from publishing at the moment. But I did want to share with you a schematic diagram cartoon I created for the grant proposal uh, last year. So she was kind enough, Erin Donahue from Purdue. Uh, I don't know if she, she must have created this. So she's got uh, just, these are my numbers in question marks here. But she's got the Yellowstone hotspot. There's our major Celeste with the Yakutat nearby and the old CPC inboard. I just, I always assumed that if the loaf was straddling the spreading center, half of it went to Alaska and half of it stayed in Washington uh, before even accreting. But I'm starting to realize that there's relationships that say that Pretty much everybody has this whole loaf accreting and then half of it being broken by the Queen Charlotte Fault and being sent to the north. And you'll see the evidence for that in just a second. Okay, I don't even want to see if we're still... Okay, we still have more than 800. I haven't turned you off completely. Would you please give me... I know, I know these get longer and longer. Would you please give me... Somebody tie me. Five minutes for John Garber. Five minutes. Ready, go. Now, this is unpublished, but he did share it in a talk at the GSA in Phoenix in 2019. So I feel comfortable sharing this with you. And John knows that I'm just sharing a couple of ideas. It's not in the literature yet. But look at what he's doing here. This is where I really had my breakthrough this morning, or at least my like super furrowed brow. I thought he had the Chugash as the same stuff as the Western Melange Belt. He's got Zircon data that ties those two guys together. And here's his spreading ridge intersecting the Pacific Northwest, which everybody agrees at this time. But it must have been like 10 o'clock this morning. I'm like, I even think I haven't colored it. Did I color it? I said, that's the Yakutat? I thought the Yakutat was like the flood basalt. I thought it was the loaf. Why would the flood basalt match the Western Melange Belt? And then I'm realizing he's got all sorts of zircon data that says he's finding really old zircons on the Yakutat and in the Polona down in Southern California. And then I'm like, Oh, so the Yakutat block is not just the flood basalt. That's just part of this Yakutat block. There's also a significant part of the Yakutat block that is not flood basalt, but it's some schist and some other rocks that are found at the southern tip of Vancouver Island and even in western Washington. How am I doing? 
three minutes left. And so he's doing this incredible roll call of details that he's found zircon-wise and other things rock-wise in the Yakutat, and he's also going through that same detail in the freaking Western Melange Belt, like, like a Mount Si above North Bend, Washington. He's finding the same exact stuff, and both of these have an almost identical signature to the Polona schist that Chris showed us outside of Los Angeles. Daddy is excited. And so Mike Eddy says, I'm, I just don't see how we can have a spreading center way down in Mexico. But John Garver says, why am I finding all these things that are so similar, some of in Alaska, some in Washington, and some in Southern Cal? I mean, I've got details, zircons. I've got details otherwise in these rocks to show this amazing match between the Yakutat, the Nanaimo, good Lord, I didn't even realize that, and the Western Melange Belt. These are the kind of zircon plots that we were talking about before. So I'll finish the John Garver thing by saying this. I don't know how many times in the live streams and otherwise I've shown this diagram. In fact, it's weather beaten because I showed it all spring when talking about Baja BC. The concept that parts of Baja Mexico are now in British Columbia, Baja BC, get it? 85 to 55, great. But you know what I never noticed? Orange is Rangelia. What's on this Baja BC block? The frickin' Chugash! And the Yakutat is along for the ride the whole way. I totally ignored that until right now. And so, yes, Patrick. We are talking about the Yakutat and the Chugash today, which is really Siletsia and the Leech River, the Leech River schist and the Baranoff schist, same rock. Daryl Cowan discovered that 40 years ago. But how much was translated north on the Queen Charlotte Fault? And more importantly, from my point of view and the research that's going to be done in the next five to 10 years, can Mike Eddy and his students, can other groups and their students help bolster the case to put that subducted spreading ridge at different points at different times? We're not there yet. And that has a massive amount of implication for how we view development of the outboard part of the fruitcake. Well, we made it, I think. I think we made it. Let's lighten things up. That was rather intense. Let's go in the cozy fort. I mean, I don't know, Baja BC, it's like Tuesdays and Thursdays, I'm super excited. Wednesdays and Mondays, I'm like, I'm not surely sure. I go back and forth every day. And this group, this research group that I'm involved with now, Stacia Gordon's a major Baja BC person. She's got students finding stuff in the in the, uh, the Polona schist, for instance. But it's sounding like Mike Eddy maybe is not as much of a Baja BC person. So even with one group of scientists, there seems to be kind of a split deal. Okay. As you can see, I don't have the cozy fort set up again. I think it's dark enough in here to make this work. Um, but I am going to uh, share a number of things with you, some field reports and a few other things as well. I hope that you enjoy this portion of the show. Let me turn off one more light. And before I do, 
uh, I think his name was Glenn. Uh, Glenn uh, has a field report from Spokane, of all places. And Glenn, I did not know about this paper. And so you, you've introduced me to this paper. And thank you for the introduction to it. And Glenn decided to use uh, the geologic pole. Uh, a Ray Wells paper, I might add. Ray Wells and others. And so when we get to Glenn's report, it's this scientific paper that is new to me, and I will enjoy learning more about it. All right, give me a second, if you would. Battery 100%. Battery 100%. Oh, it's muted. Daddy's learning. We start with a video field report from Anna in Santa Barbara. And she sent a PowerPoint presentation. Let me show you some of this. There's some narration from her. Oh, boy. California's transverse ranges, a geomorphic province bordering the Pacific Ocean. Sixteen million years ago, during the Miocene Epoch, this exotic terrain tore away from the Peninsular Ranges province, now to the south. Since then, it has rotated clockwise 110 degrees while riding on the Pacific Plate. A portion is underwater and faulting trends east to west. Being submerged during the late Cretaceous epoch 100 to 66 million years ago gave birth to a sedimentary unit of sandstone and shale called the Halama Formation that is widespread in the Santinez Mountains and visible along the mountain crest west of Santa Barbara. A particularly erosion-resistant sandstone within this unit forms the scenic Nahoy Falls area. An easy hike less than one half mile long brings you to the falls in about 15 minutes. The trail ascends through a heavily shaded box canyon. Here we see the canyon's two rock types both characteristic of an underwater depositional environment, layered dark gray to black shale to the left that easily fractures and cement-like arcosic sandstone to the right that is light gray to tan in color. It's interbedded with a variety of pre-weathered rock. <laughs> A few steps further and we've reached our destination, Nahoy Falls, which drops 164 feet to the canyon floor. An advancing waterfall, it builds out rather than eroding back because of sediments in the stream that feeds it. Due to the current drought, it's a mere trickle today, but has roared mightily in the past. Thanks for your attention and interest in the exotic terrain I call home. Southern California's Western Transverse Ranges, one of only six in North America. Thank you, Anna. That was well done. So we really are tying Southern California with some research groups with the Pacific Northwest and even further north yet. Ralph, who sent in a couple of samples from Silesia, from the Bremerton area, uh, has a one minute and 30 minute, one minute and 30 second clip from his exposure of Crescent Basalt, part of Silesia. Hiya, Nick and viewers out there. This is Crescent Formation Basalt, south of Bremerton, Washington, just off of Highway 3. The easternmost outcrop of crescent basalt, part of the Silesia terrain. 
More crescent formation basalt. Note the vesicles and the lack of pillow basalts. This basalt was undoubtedly erupted above the ocean. But that's not the only story here. This outcrop is part of Green and Gold Mountain, over a thousand feet above sea level, south of the Seattle Fault, uplifted over a thousand feet by Seattle Fault quakes. But that's still not the only story here. Green Mountain, a few miles to the west of here, has Eocene andesitic dikes from 30 million years ago. Certainly part of the Kula Plate story. That's still not the only story for these mountains because they're overtopped on the very top, a thousand feet up, with glacial deposits. Yes, the glaciers rolled right over the top of these mountains. Have fun, folks. Bye. Thank you, Ralph. Good job. And thank you for the rock samples. I only showed one, but you sent three or four of those samples from that outcrop. I appreciate it very much, as I do with everybody who's contributing to our series. Uh, forgot, uh, Gary and... This is Gary and Marilyn from Olympia, I believe. Three-minute video. Hi, Nick. Good morning, everybody. My name is Gary Ritchie. This is my wife, Marilyn. Good morning. We're here on the south shore of Puget Sound, just east of the city of Olympia, Washington, which is the state capital. And we're about 100 miles due west of where Nick lives in Ellensburg. And we're also right slap dab in the middle of Silesia. So let's go take a look at a map and uh, get oriented to this area and where Silesia is. I downloaded this map from the internet. It comes from a paper by McCrory and Wilson in the journal Tectonics, volume 30, number two, 2013. I think you recognize this as the northwest coast of North America. Here's Vancouver Island. This is Puget Sound. This is the Olympic Peninsula. Here's where the Columbia reaches the ocean at Astoria. Astoria. So this is all Washington here, and then this is Oregon down here. The coast range goes up the coast through Oregon up into Washington and terminates here in the Olympic Peninsula in the Olympic Mountain Range. This is the Cascade Range towards the east. The green area is the known extent of Silesia, and the dark green areas are places where Silesia is near enough to the surface where it can be observed. So what we're going to do today is we're going to drive out from here where we live to a place called the Black Hills, where we will be able to visit a quarry, an abandoned quarry, near the little town of Tumwater, Washington, and we can have a nice close-up look of some of this basalt from the Crescent Formation, which is the main basalt uh, in Silesia. So let's go. We're over here at Black Lake Resources, which is a quarry that's been operating here uh, near Olympia for many decades, taking a look at the crescent formation. You can see it's got both columnar basalt, a very spectacular columnar basalt, and then other types of basalt uh, that are not columnar. Uh, I'm sure there's also pillow basalt here, but I don't see anything right at this particular spot. This rock is used a great deal over here on the west side of the mountains for construction purposes, uh, to build retaining walls, crush up, used for gravel. It's extremely useful, especially in an area like this where we don't have that much exposed bedrock to work with. Well, we're back. We had a great time. Hope you all enjoyed it. We'd like to wish you a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. Back to you, Nick.
<laughs> Thank you, Gary and Marilyn. Nice job. Uh, okay, that's the end of the movie files I have on my desktop. Now I got a few uh, links. Have you found Geologically Speaking yet? It's all out here to see Exotic terrains and food analogies Fridays and Sundays for you and me 90 to 120 minute Geology Todd Smith from San Clemente, California 120, yeah, that's a minimum these days. Thank you, Todd. Um, Glenn from Spokane, 12-minute video. We're going to watch the first three minutes of it. Glenn, hope you don't mind. But Glenn's the guy that turned me on to this paper, co-written by Ray Wells. Well, good afternoon. I'm not Zick. Nick Zentner, as you can clearly see, I'm Glenn Crookshank. I live over that way uh, near Liber Lake, Washington. It's about 30 miles away. It's behind John Stockton's house. Uh, I'm up on a hillside overlooking the Spokane River, uh, which is actually inside of Long Lake right now. Uh, but uh, today is a field report on finding the geological pole for the clockwise rotation of the Pacific Northwest crust. Where have we heard that before? Uh, so thank you, Nick, though, first of all, for, uh, for telling us what that is and spending uh, uh, the entire summer and fall uh, teaching us more about that. So this has really been great uh, during the course of the, uh, uh, the pandemic. So thank you very much. Uh, and you're sort of sparked the reason why I'm up on the hillside today on a kind of a cold, snowy day. So uh, Euler poles. Uh, so we're, we're going to talk about what's called a Euler pole. And a Euler pole is simply a point on a globe that describes the rotation of a piece of crust. So here's a diagram that I packed all the way up here uh, that shows uh, that this crust rotates, and it rotates around an axis, and that axis is called a uh, Euler pole uh, or uh, also a geologic pole. So it's called, Euler is, uh, well, he was a, uh, a Swiss mathematician back in the uh, 1700s. He was kind of a rock star. Uh, he did all sorts of uh, math and a lot of topics. Uh, he also popularized pi, uh, the 3.14159 pi, not raspberry pi or cherry pi or apple pi. Um, but Euler pole is just that. So the field report then, uh, is, uh, is because me, Nick got us interested in, uh, in the topic of clockwise rotation, and he said it every other uh, session, it seems like. <laughs> so guess what? I did some research and found yet another report uh, on, uh, on the clockwise rotation uh, of the Pacific Northwest. So this is a, uh, a 2017 report uh, by Brocher and other USGS geologists, uh, and they have quite an interesting paper on uh, on determining uh, how uh, the Euler pole or the geographic pole for the clockwise rotation uh, that Nick talks about. The, uh, so what they've done is uh, looked at both the GPS uh, data that Nick talked about, uh, they looked at, uh, at faults, and they looked at uh, earthquake centers, and they determined that based on all this data that there is a uh, geologic pole over here by Spokane, Washington. Now, I, Nick, I know that Nick mentioned that there are perhaps a, a rotation pole down by Pendleton. Uh, okay, uh, that may be for one of the plates, but these gentlemen uh, did this uh, pretty massive uh, study uh, about three years ago, and using that came up with a, uh, a Euler pole here in the, near Spokane, Washington. So what they did uh, is looked at a lot of striped slick faults, a lot of earthquake centers, and they came up really with an average. Uh, and, and this average uh, works out to be 47 degrees 87 west, 107 degrees 17, 73 east, which is actually right where we're standing right now, if you can see this. Uh, actually, it's just down over the hill here, but I didn't want to climb all the way down there. It was kind of nasty, rough. But we're in the middle of a clear cut, and uh, uh, we can sort of... Thank you very much, Glenn, for scrambling all the way up there. I, I don't know much about that topic. 
Um, I'm looking forward to learning more. I thought it was pronounced Euler as well. Looks like people are saying it's Euler. That's how much I know. So great job and uh, thank you for the introduction to that paper. So I'll, I'll try to learn as much as I can about that. Uh, I don't know, do we need this? So I, Until the discovery of one minute. tectonics in the 1960s, these mountains were a big mystery. We now have a very clear picture from Olympic National the Park. Olympic Peninsula was created from scratch over the last 50 million years. Damn it. What's with the bleaching out? The Hurricane Ridge Road from Port Angeles climbs more than 5,000 feet into the heart of Olympic National Park. The 18 mile road ends at a visitor center with absolutely jaw dropping views of the non volcanic Olympic Mountain. But along the way, at milepost 11, a surprise. Hurricane Ridge Road. Well, wait a minute now, this is basalt. Hurricane Ridge is made out of basalt? These are like the lavas of Eastern Washington. But there's a specific difference. This lava is 55 million years old and much of it is round like this. You see, these are pillow basalts. And pillow basalts are a specific rounded form that form when the lava crackles and flows out into the Pacific Ocean. So we're thousands of feet above the Pacific, but these pillow basalts tell us that this is an ocean story, and then these lavas got added along with all that deep sea sediment that we were talking about moments ago. Hurricane Ridge basalts, these pillow basalts are perfect along the road up to the top of Hurricane Ridge. The basalt of Hurricane Ridge is a major part of the story. It wasn't just deep sea sediment. 55 million years ago, there was a huge island off the coast of Washington and Oregon. We call it Siletsia. Nine mile stack of basalt built off the ocean floor. What's that got to do with the Olympic Peninsula? Well, everything because the basalt of Hurricane Ridge and those pillows are a direct result of Siletsia coming in and cramming on to the edge of North America. What about the spreading ridge, huh? 50 million years ago. The... What about the spreading ridge, chicken? How about you tell us about the subducting spreading ridge? Now, I've used this for years, and this is Jenda Johnson, who is an excellent animator, and... Um, um, I'm working on a new animation with her next week, as a matter of fact. But she chooses, with some of her sources for this video, to show a very simple version of the loaf of bread coming in. Avoiding the Yellowstone hotspot even and avoiding the spreading ridge discussion. Years to a time prior to stretching of the continent by basin and range extension, and when Mesozoic subduction, compression, and crustal thickening had waned. At the end of the Cretaceous, the Siletsia oceanic terrain created on the Farallon Plate approaches the western margin of the continent at about 55 million years. The Farallon Plate is near flat beneath the continent and magmatism wanes. As the oceanic terrain is accreted, subduction jumps westward and the Farallon slab fails and founders, leaving the remnant Juan de Fuca Plate offshore. Well, I'm a huge fan of Jenda Johnson. Nobody's a bigger fan than I am. All of her animations are at Iris Earthquake um, YouTube channel, like Iris Earthquake. Um, she's got one for Alaska involving the Yakutat. Again, she works with research scientists to put this together. She's not dreaming this up on her own. Um, so I'll show you 30 seconds of this one buckle and break to form a new subduction zone outboard of the accreted terrain. In that case, magma generation would resume to form a new volcanic arc. The Yakutat terrain is an oceanic plateau that traveled northwest on the Pacific Plate. It is bounded by the Queen Charlotte Fairweather Transform Fault, the Chugach St. Elias Thrust Fault, the Aleutian Megathrust, and the Transition Fault on the south. 
About 25 million years ago, the Yakutat terrain began colliding with and wedging beneath the continental margin. The top of the subducting plate is only 50 kilometers deep, directly below Anchorage, 400 kilometers from the trench. Because Yakutat crust is thicker and more buoyant than the Pacific Oceanic yeah. crust of the southwest, the Yakutat megathrust boundary is an interface of... So they've got the Yakutat accreting up there starting 25, is that what they said, 25 million years ago? But that's the second accretion of the Yakutat. The first accretion was to here in the Pacific Northwest involving the subduction of the spreading ridge. Was that 50? And if so, when exactly did half of the loaf, the Yakutat half of the loaf, get sheared away from the Pacific Northwest? What's the date for that? And then sending it north. And that's assuming it didn't come from Southern California. That's more of the Mike Eddy's discussion of just coming from the Pacific Northwest. One more, and we need to finish with this. I met Michael Eddy for the first time this past summer. And we met uh, above Wenatchee near Mission Ridge ski area, August, I think it was. And he was with his current PhD student, Aaron Donaghy. I don't know, have you ever met somebody for the first time after reading their stuff for years and then you stick a camera and a microphone in their face immediately? That's weird. Well, that's exactly what I did. I wanted to record the 20 minute discussion I had with them. They were just stretching their legs before they were driving all the way back to Indiana after doing field work. But this portion of our conversation, I didn't know anything about at the time, but involves our players today. Celestia, Chugash, and Aaron is working with sediments on top of the Chugash and Celestia. The mic's bad on this, but hopefully you can ignore that. I can't, but hopefully you can. I'm thinking three minutes of this, and then we'll go to your questions. Stuff going up to Alaska at the same time it's sending stuff here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I think, yeah, that's definitely, uh, I probably don't even want to drag Aaron into this, but uh, I think having, having the triple junction down here, having a spreading ridge intersecting Washington, and having the Kula or the resurrection plate moving very obliquely relative to North America, yeah provides a good mechanism for uh, sort of clipping little bits of North America off and sending them up to Alaska. Uh, but that is definitely uh, not, there is lots of discussion about whether that uh, sure. happened. Yeah, that's, that's not a con necessarily a consensus view. So Aaron, you're starting your PhD or you're finishing your first year with Mike in Purdue. Uh, and was Alaska part of your is it still part of your plan? Yeah, it's it's still part of the plan. We just weren't able to get out there this summer. For obvious reasons, so. right? <laughs> yes, uh, unfortunately. So earlier this week or last week or whatever, you were over at the Olympics. Uh, what were you doing in the Olympics? And then we, were you going to try to find similar stuff up in Alaska? Yeah, that's the idea. There's uh, this idea that there was a... Uh, oceanic island plateau that had collided with the coast of Washington just prior to the formation of the Trumpstick Basin. Mm -hmm. And that there's also this hypothesis that part of Alaska, the Yakutat terrain, was once part of that plateau. And that it's since then been translated up north and is now currently colliding with southeastern Alaska. And so Part of my PhD and my PhD focus will be to look at the sedimentary rocks that are sitting on top of Celestia, which is the interpreted oceanic plateau sitting off of Washington and mm -hmm. through Oregon. Mm -hmm. Look at those sedimentary rocks there, and then also look at the sedimentary sequence sitting on top of Yakutat and see if we can once, if we can recognize where the sediments were coming from, what yeah. the basins looked like, was there a point where they, the depositional environments were similar, we could see sediment routing systems that would suggest that they were once part of the same plateau, and then could we see when, they, when the Yakutat train broke off and started its northward journey to its current position in Alaska. So there's a potential for an identical twin <laughs> up in Alaska 
uh, of the Siletsia and some <laughs> of those sediments that you had here in the Olympics? Yes. Like, uh, so that's a, uh, that idea has been around for a while, but mm -hmm. Ray Wells at the USGS really, uh, in 2014, sort of tied everything together nicely. Yes. And uh, that sort of spurred a lot of our questions about, well, can we, can we now go in and really test that if we can um, go up to Alaska and sort of better characterize some of the sedimentary units in the Olympics? Um, I'm having a hard time picturing where the sedimentary material is coming from if it's just this big ocean plateau sitting out there in the water. So is it after it docks that the sediment's coming off of North America? So that's a, a big question, where the sediment's coming from and um, whether or not it was just being locally sourced from the, the oceanic plateau uh -huh. or whether or not it's coming from the continent. Uh, that's part of the project is to figure out where these sediments were coming from and tie it all in with previous work that's been done there with paleocurrent and compositional data and and then we can kind of bracket it using high precision geochronology, dating some of the volcanic material in there and try to see that transition wow. of where sediments were originally being derived from and then how it has changed. Super cool. But one of the <laughs> interesting things that we noticed as we were reading theses and looking at maps while we were out in the Olympics is that uh, there are are some sizable units that appear to be derived from the west uh, out in the Olympic Peninsula, uh, and there's nothing to the west now. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we had, well, Erin has her, has her work cut out for her, but there's some interesting features up there that, that are ripe to be explored. Am I getting what you're saying? Sediment that's younger than Celestia accretion that had a, a source to the west of Silesia that's not there anymore. So, but post-date the accretion, and then, um, uh, yeah. then it's not there anymore. <laughs> yeah, so there's there's some interesting units out there that seem like they're derived from the west, and yeah, there's there's nothing there now. So you go north to look for it? It has to be north, <laughs> right? Like, where else would you look? That's where we look, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. Um, so uh, I was working on the same project. Well, that's where things stand at the moment. And I saw some of your comments right there, and you're feeling like you can follow some of what they're saying. And that's a good thing. Uh, it always takes me a few times to read an email or to listen to something. Um, but... Uh, we eventually get there. It's time for your questions. I'm not even going to look at my watch. I know it's late. Uh, uppercase, please. And we will try to wrap this up before Liz gets home. I'm popping the chat out like a boss. Right between the eyes, I'm doing live chat. That's, that's how I roll personally. I'm just kind of a live chat guy, even though I think I always set things up where all comments are included, so it doesn't even really matter, I don't think, but whatever. Let's try a few of these. I have no idea where you are, to be honest. If, if you gave up long ago or everything made perfect sense, I can't believe everything made perfect sense. That was pretty scattered, but um, the vibe is getting fresh, breaking stuff uh, even before things are published, and I hope that you enjoyed that aspect of this. Papa Gino, how does the Colombian embayment fit in? I don't know. Um, I have a list. I literally have a list of things that I want to follow up on and eventually try to do something with, and that's one of them. So I can't even guess at the moment. Thank you. Um, Mount Silvania. Uh, is the subducted Kula plate visible in the mantle? Subducted Kula plate. So uh, thank you for the question. So as I understand it, the entire history of the Kula Plate is going north. And so therefore, as I understand it, the entire history of the Kula Plate subducted beneath Alaska. And I don't know if there's been tomography work done up there yet. And then there's also this weird capture. I should read that. 
I was feeling like things were dragging with Mike Eddy's email, and maybe they really were. They probably were, but uh, he's got something that I feel like I want to toss in right now. Um, Interesting, this is Mike Eddy. Interestingly, 50 million years ago marks a dramatic change in plate motions around the entire Pacific Basin, like at the bend in the Emperor Hawaiian Seamount chain. So a change in relative plate motions and a change in how the triple junction was moving along the margin isn't an ad hoc idea, in my opinion. Also, the Kula plate was captured by the Pacific plate during this period of time and the kula Farallon north America triple junction evolved into the pacific Juan de Fuca north America triple junction. So I don't, I don't know how that works. I can't visualize the Pacific plate capturing the Kula plate. Like the Kula plate becomes stagnant because it no longer has a connection to a spreading ridge, and then the Pacific plate, I don't get it. So I think that's part of why we maybe can't find a bunch of subducted Kula plate visible in the mantle. But Karin Sigloch was finding the subducted Farallon plate, if you recall, that stuff that went all the way from the Juan de Fuca plate all the way down to the lower mantle. But you're right, the Kula plate, if it's subducted somewhere, have we found it yet? Great question. James, how does the building of the Canadian Rockies, which stopped around 60 million years ago, work with Celestia accreditation, or accretion, and ocean plates about the same time. That's on my list. I think I'm semi-serious about doing more live streams. I guess I'll talk more about this on Sunday when we're finishing this one. But I've avoided the Rockies, our biggest mountain range, by the way, in North America. I've avoided the Rockies my whole career, just like I've avoided the North Cascades. And obviously the Rocky Mountains are building during uh, at least the last part of this exotic terrain accretion story. And I would like to explore some of the ideas that are out there. There's a bunch of stuff that doesn't sit right with everybody involving a bunch of things. So it's on my list, James. I got nothing for you now. Even if I did, I maybe wouldn't share it with you now. I need to save something for the next series. Um, 101 rotary power, is there any way a common person can see the physical difference between Celetsi and flood basalt around the boundaries? Excellent question. Like in hand sample, if you pick up Celetsi and you pick up Columbia River basalt, do they look any different? I don't think so. In hand sample, I don't think so. You grind them up and look at the isotopic signature, there's major differences, but I don't, I don't, I don't know of any difference. They all, both have fesicles, they both have pillows, they, they look like regular run-of-the-mill basalt as far as I can tell. A few more, it's four o'clock for goodness sake. Uh, is Celestia now called Vancouver Island or is Celestia further inland? Celestia is just that very southern tip. Too many papers, can't find it. So most of Vancouver Island is Rangelia, which is a much older story. You know what? That's what I'll do. That's how we'll finish. I'm sorry if I didn't get to your question. I got a couple of new thoughts in addition to our wrapping it all up. So most of it will just try to be take all the stuff we've already talked about and putting it together. But a couple new thoughts I have that I'll have you think about is why did the Straight Creek Fault begin and why did it end? And earlier than that, why did Baja BC begin and why did it end? Can we somehow tie special moments of putting the fruitcake together? Is there something major in our accretion history that is setting the table specifically for major strike slip translation within the fruitcake. And speaking of fruitcake, Jeff Clindworth I saw was still with us. I'm not sure if he's still with us, but Jeff has been a special friend throughout this whole series. And uh, I'll figure something out, Jeff, on how to use this second 
problem. I, may, I still have the first fruitcake from Vinman's Bakery, and this is the second, and I've now got the Georgia fruitcake, and I still have some of Dara's Texas fruitcake. Um, I'll come up with something involving all those scraps of fruitcake uh, in a way that we put everything together on Sunday morning. A toast to you! This episode of Nick From Home brought to you by Pernicious India Pale Ale from Wicked Weed Brewing. Oh, good Lord, what is in this stuff? Don't have time to read. Here's to your health. Ooh, damn, girl. Well, that's good. Um, here's to the health of everyone in your immediate family and extended family. Honest to God. Here's to their health. Here's to all the hard workers that are busting their butt every hour of every day, especially those that are delivering packages of varying degrees of importance. There are some precious packages happening, I think starting this week and going all the way around the world. And those packages have hope inside of them. So here's to those delivery people. Worldwide. And here's to you, uh, to stick with a, a program like this, I, I honestly, back in September, never dreamed I'd be doing the complicated stuff we're doing right now. I didn't think I'd get this deep into it, this deeply into it. But all these very generous geologists who are happy to take time to email stuff, whether they've seen the live streams or not, they know that I'm delivering it to a crowd and they're devoting time to put their work into common words so that I can understand it and therefore uh, send it on to you. Uh, here's to those who understand that it's important to communicate science. Thank you for joining us today. Seletsia, old ideas, new ideas, the Chugash exotic terrain, old ideas, new ideas. The Yakutat, old ideas, new ideas. Here's to new ideas and new work coming down the road. I'll see you Sunday morning, session Z at 9 a.m. Pacific time. Thank you for joining us. Almost dark outside. Still a little bit of snow on the ground. Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, other things. Celebrate good times, come on, Yahoo. He's reaching for the white X. Thank you, I love you, and goodbye.